I was 23 years old in South Beach, Miami, at a mansion with spiral staircases and chandeliers and all the drugs and alcohol you could imagine. And I was invited there because I was young and good-looking and I would give it up for anyone who had drugs. And that's how everyone else was there, too. And just before the sun came up, a young man, a boy, honestly, he was only 19, he came over. <clears throat> and I asked him if he had been drinking, and he said no. And that was really good news for me because I wanted to give him some GHB. And you might not know what GHB is, but it's a party drug that acts as a depressant, like alcohol, but it also makes you feel euphoric, a little bit like ecstasy. So I carefully poured him a safe amount of GHB, just to boost up his evening a little bit and get him on my level and on our level. <clears throat> and suddenly, I noticed him stumbling around a little bit later, and I went over to him and he looked dizzy, and I looked him in the eyes and they looked empty. <clears throat> suddenly, he collapsed into me. I knew right then he must have lied about that he had not been drinking. GHB is extremely dangerous. If you mix it with alcohol, it, it can lead to depressed breathing, unconsciousness, and even death. He collapsed into me and I broke his fall and we fell to the marble floor. And I'd seen this happen before at nightclubs, guys falling out, passing out, and um, having to be taken to the hospital on stretchers out of, out of clubs. And I just knew I had to revive him, so I dragged him into a marble shower and there was massive windows overlooking the bay. I turned the water on cold because I thought that would help wake him up. The sun was rising and the most beautiful sunlight was grazing his face and it was hitting the drool that was spilling out from his mouth. And he wasn't breathing. <clears throat> so I started to panic. I put my head to his chest and there was no heartbeat. So I started doing CPR and I wasn't even sure if I was doing it correctly. Like, I still don't even know. When's the last time I've done CPR? I maybe learned in 10th grade PE class and... I started doing like 30 chest compressions and two breaths. Am I doing it right? Like I still don't even know. And his body started to turn the scariest shade of blue. <clears throat> I looked down beyond his wet glistening torso and I noticed that he had defecated and that's when I knew he was gonna die. In my denial, I kept doing CPR because I was just, I was just so scared. And then after the longest moment, just before I gave up, he started to breathe ever so softly. And I just put my head to his chest and I swear I can still feel the chill of the cold water hitting my face. And I jumped up and I pulled him out of the shower and I took him with a friend. We went to the closest hospital. Lucky for us, it was two blocks away. And we drove up to the emergency entrance and we dropped him off and we just held him out and we were like, he came to us like this. He must be on drugs, we said. And we left. I found out later that he was in the ICU for two weeks. That his parents flew in it was his first time in Miami, it was on a spring break, but he survived. <clears throat> he survived. He survived, but who was I? Like, how, how did a son from a great family from Northern Virginia end up here? <laughs> I like to joke that I fell out of my mother's womb right into her heels. <laughs> and I used to parade around the house and I used to like walk around in her slips and her shoes and her dresses and whatever and like put on shows and it was a hoot. And so I could tell that this wasn't really, this was hard for my dad who has that easy type of masculinity, the type I've always wanted, a deep voice and stoic demeanor. I probably wasn't, uh, you know, he was, he was tall and strong. He was an athlete. I probably wasn't really the son he envisioned, you know, so I mean, I wouldn't necessarily pin him as the next president of a local PFLAG chapter, but I just, I grew up believing that there was something inherently wrong with me because I was gay. And because of that belief, I desperately was seeking the approval of my father through my adolescence. My sister, uh, my sister, she's an athlete too, and she's a great athlete, an incredible one, actually. She just won the Women's World Cup this last summer. 
Um, okay, okay, back to me, back to me. So, <laughs> uh, and this, wait, this past weekend, she just qualified for the Olympics. So, yeah. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> she was always on the front page of every newspaper, winning every accolade you can imagine. I was always so proud. <clears throat> but I just felt like I just never could measure up. And I was an athlete too, you know, like I played soccer and gymnastics and being an athlete was something that made me feel a part of my family. And I, I just, like I said, I just felt like I never measure up. I always, I always felt different. I always felt empty and so much so that I would sit on my second story bedroom window so <clears throat> with my legs hanging out the window and just thinking in fear that I would feel like I, like I was just in fear that I would never belong or feel like I would never belong. And I'd sit there and I'd just think, like, should I jump? Should I just end it now? And all that changed when I turned 15 and I went over to my friend's house in a New Year's Eve party in a basement and there was boys in the corner and they were sitting over there and they were drinking out of a handle of Jack Daniels. <laughs> and they were like, you wanna, hey Kyle, you want a drink? And first drink. I was like, yes. <laughs> yes, I need a drink. I needed a drink when I was two. And so I went over there and I filled up a red solo cup of Jack Daniels to the brim. Oh yeah, y'all feel me. <laughs> so I filled it to the brim and I drank all of it in like probably like one or two swigs. And for the first time in my life, I didn't have to feel, I didn't have to think. And all of those feelings of not being good enough and being just feeling less than just disappeared. And as the liquor filled me up, I didn't feel empty anymore. I had found my cure. <laughs> and of course, like the room went spinning and I blacked out and I threw up everywhere. I probably ruined everyone's night, but <laughs> I wanted to feel that way for the rest of my life. And I couldn't wait to feel that way again. The funny thing about becoming an alcoholic is that everyone tells you that alcohol is the problem, but what they don't understand is that alcohol isn't the problem, that it's the solution. That I drank to feel better and when I did, my life, my life got worse and worse, kind of like a hurricane tearing through the lives of the people that I loved. First, it's like a category one, and then eventually I was a full-blown, devastating category five. I drank all the time. I tried to hide my drinking from my friends and family. I snuck liquor from the cabinets, and I went out drinking underage, and I drove home drunk. And one night, I drove my car into four police officers that were cleaning up a previous accident in front of the Pentagon at 4 a.m., and I got a DUI, and I went to jail. I went to college, I got kicked out, and I didn't graduate. My sister was on her, on her hospital. <clears throat> my sister was in the hospital for a pulmonary embolism, potentially on her deathbed, and I couldn't even show up for her. I put myself in situations where I was raped because I just wanted to get high. I put my friends, family, everyone around me in danger just because it was so painful to be in my own skin. And the more I drank, the worse I felt, and then the more I needed drugs and alcohol. I mean, most of you, some of you, whatever, you probably can have like one or two drinks and be fine. And then there's that girl at the party who, after everyone else has gone home, she's there stumbling around, too messy to say no. That girl, that girl's me. <laughs> I'm dropping off that boy's unconscious body in Miami to the hospital. I knew I had to change my life and I knew it had to be really big and it had to be serious. So I did some intense soul searching. And I thought to myself, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna do a master cleanse. And that is the best I could come up with, a master cleanse. I mean, could you die? So after, of course, like a good old alcoholic, after five days of drinking lemon juice and cayenne pepper, I was ready for more Patron, right? <laughs> So that night, I got a bottle of tequila and I drank all of it and I stumbled home drunk because I couldn't find my keys. So I'd, I stumbled home drunk and I couldn't find my keys and I broke into my own house and I broke a window and I crawled through it. And I woke up in a puddle of like dry blood and broken glass. My eyes were dark, sunken in my face and my skin was pale and wet from sweat. My nose was raw from the crystal meth I had been snorting. And I looked at my hand and my keys were there the whole time. 
I was the loneliest I'd ever felt. <clears throat> and I sat up and I, there was just like nowhere left to go. No one. I pushed everyone in my life away from me. And in that moment of desperation, I remembered there was a young lady at work. I overheard her talking about a place where she would go and she would talk about her drug and alcohol abuse with other recovering people and she felt safe and she felt comfortable and she felt like she got a new lease on life there. And so I called her. Viv, I said, I need you to take me to that place. That place where you've, that place where you've been going to get help. And she said, I'm on my way there right now. And I said, can I come? And she said, yes. She was like, I'm driving down your street. <clears throat> so I stumbled downstairs and I went outside and there she was pulling up in her Ford Explorer and I jumped in the front seat. And I went to my first 12-step meeting with her and I'll never forget this day for the rest of my life. And I walked up, it was a white clubhouse on a corner lot next to a tow yard and there was intimidatingly attractive men outside smoking cigarettes and laughing. And I walked into the front door and there was a greeting line of people with huge smiles on their faces and holding out their hand to shake mine. And the first person I saw was my hairstylist. And the first thing he said to me was, was welcome home. <clears throat> I walked into the next door. The air smelled like a fresh pot of coffee on a Sunday morning and the chairs were mixed matched and the walls were white and they had uplifting slogans on them like easy does it and keep it simple. God, everybody looks so different than I imagined them, like the bums on the street. I imagine, you know, I just, professionals, businessmen and women, students, young teens, housewives, every race, color, and religion, alcoholism didn't discriminate. I sat down in my seat and there was a lady at the front and her name was Doris and she told her story. And everything that I felt as a child, she was putting into words so articulate. She articulated them perfectly, just about all the loneliness and inadequacy that I felt. And I sat down and my tears ran down my face and I looked around the room towards the end of the meeting and everyone who looked so intimidated at first now looked more and more like family. My heart began to soften and the ice around it began to melt. And I felt home. I got up to leave and they grabbed me and they said, please keep going back. Which was funny because I hadn't been asked back anywhere in a really long time. <laughs> and so I went back. I went back every single day. And my life got better, but my first year was so hard. You know, like my life turned upside down. I wore alcohol as an armor and I just go through life and I just didn't have that anymore and I couldn't shake your hand. I couldn't meet your eyes. I couldn't talk to you face to face. I wore tons of layers and I would cry all the time and I was moody and I wet. I was just like sweaty. I was just a mess, you know, and, but I was getting better. I mean, forget about a first date sober. They suck without a drink. Like, I couldn't do anything. After six months, I chaired, I, I led my own crystal meth meeting, 12 cent meeting in that same clubhouse, and I would show up early, and I would put the chairs in a circle, and I would make the coffee, and set up the literature for newcomers and every time someone would come in, I'd greet them with a hug. It was new. <clears throat> and I would sit there in disbelief that this was my life now, that I got to sit here and share with these people about our experience and through a message of hope with one another. And just six months ago, I was dropping off a teenager's body that I had given an overdose to. I think of my sobriety as a gift. I think of it as the greatest gift that I've ever been given. And I hold on to it, and I nurture it, and I take care of it by giving it away. And I give it away to people who need a second chance and a helping hand like I did. And working and connecting with others has filled up all the emptiness that I felt as a child with an authentic sense of love and belonging. My favorite part about being sober is that I'm present. That I'm present for every day. That I'm present for every feeling in my body and all those feelings I pushed down for so long that I feel them, whether painful or joyous. 
and it's not always easy. But just like everything in life, we walk through it, not around it, not under it, but through. Thank you.